What's up guys and gals and welcome back to the Nerd Castle. My name is Splattercat and today we're going to be starting out a new series. Now, I'm going to leave this one up to you as always. If I if you run through this episode and you're like, "God, that game was super boring, Splattercat." Then I'll probably find something else to play, but I did at least want to introduce you guys to Eador, Masters of the Broken World. Now, what is Eador? Eador is a hero-based 4X strategy game that's a lot like Warlock, Master of the Arcane. It's colorful, it has loads of magic, so it is a high magic fantasy campaign. Additionally, you're running a group of heroes, though, on the side, so you rule as the kingdom, kind of the kingdom head. You are the king or the emperor or whatever title you like to designate. I prefer Grand High Puba, that's my favorite one, but... Additionally, you have a adventuring group or two that you will command and move around. They level up, they gather equipment and gear, they find cooler staves of Poketude, and so it has that extra aspect that I very much like. There's a lot of RPG stuff to like here. Some people have complained that the game is overly dense, and I will say that there's a lot of depth to this title. And so there's going to be a lot of explanations in this first episode. It's one of those things that I feel like you guys need to be on the same page as me. Otherwise, it'll seem like I'm clicking through dozens of different menus, and it might not be as entertaining as I would hope. We're not going to be playing the campaign today, because I feel like the campaign is not something that I'm very interested in. Instead, I feel like the meat and potatoes of this game can be found under the custom game icon here. So we're going to click that, and we're going to go generate a new shard. Now, a couple of stipulations here as we go through. I'm not very good at this game. That's stipulation numero uno. I'm probably going to be playing this game on a low difficulty because this game has the propensity and the ability to completely and totally flatten you if you underestimate it. This game will quite literally destroy you on the higher difficulties. It has no problem just sort of stepping on your throat and like kind of laughing and doing kind of a little booty dance as it wiggles away off into the sunset. So I'm going to be playing on skill today. We're going to play a small map with three players all of which on skilled. I've beaten the game a couple times on skilled, although I do lose every now and again, so just bear that in mind. I'm not very good at this game. The second stipulation has to do with what I already said. We're going to be stopping and doing a lot of detours talking about the game as we go along. Just tons and tons of things that need to be explained. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get the map generating, and I hope that this turns out to be an LP which everybody can get behind, have a lot of fun with, and also, I hope that you'll give the game a look-see. To be fair, one of the big reasons I got into LPing is that there's a lot of games out there that I don't think ever get the critical acclaim that they deserve, and Eador is one of them. I like this game very much. In fact, I like it better than Warlock, which is saying something, because I like Warlock quite a bit, too. Now, here we are in our first starting zone with the city of Whitestone. This is our capital right here. How beautiful. It's got castles, it's got parapets, it's got tavern wenches, everything you could want from a fantasy kingdom. Now, there's a couple things we want to think about on our first turn. We're going to take a look at what's surrounding us. We've got a swamp, or a swamp, that is ruled by goblins called Muddy Waters, so they must be fans of blues and bluegrass over here. We've got a... what is this? It looks like we've got a hilly region that's ruled by orcish tribes called Aknir Dush. So, I don't even... <laughs> if it's got Dush in the name of the city, you don't even want to know the kind of people that live there. We've got By Place which is ruled by outlaws, and we've also got the Pixie Woods, which is owned by outlaws. So we're probably going to expand out into the forest first, but what we really want to note is the surrounding terrain. That's the first big decision you're going to make, because this game is a heavily tech tree based game. Now if we look at our construction tree here, this is where you're going to spend the entire game. Now, many 4X games are going to ask you to research technologies, to research civics, things of that nature. Not Eador. Eador is not that sort of game. In fact, everything in this game is a building, which I think is an interesting turn of events. We've got eight quarters, the central quarter, the entertainment quarter, the magic quarter, the trade quarter, the military quarter, the temple quarter, the craftsman quarter, and the forest quarter. These all have different buildings. There's, there's dozens of buildings in each of these tabs. We'll talk about what each of them do as we go along. There's also a kind of ninth hidden tab right here at the bottom called the foreign quarter. If we ever end up making an alliance with an enemy or with a neutral faction, this is where the units they send us will be housed here in the foreign quarter. So what we want to start with is we want to think about getting ourselves some revenue. So we're going to go to the trade quarter. And there's a couple buildings here to be interested in. There's the granary. The granary is going to make our city grow faster. So we probably want to build that pretty soon, but we're going to put that on the back burner for now. Additionally, there's the tavern. I'm going to go with the tavern first because it unlocks a bunch of things. One thing that I like about this game is it's transparent about what every building you build actually generates. It says it opens access to all these different buildings right here. So there's never any confusion about what am I getting when I construct something. Additionally, we'll get one gold per turn in this investiture. So let's go for it. 
And it actually, the side reason that I'm building the tavern is because there's a unit I want that it unlocks. Because we're going to be hiring heroes pretty soon, and they need a retinue to go around with them and adventure like crazy. Because we need treasure, and also cool things to look shiny and make us appear regal. Other buildings we might want to think about once this is done are going to be located in the military quarter. So in the military quarter, you're going to find all of the units divided into tiers that you can build throughout the complete and total course of the game. So there's everything from tier 1 to 4, and you can only unlock a certain number of units in each tab. So that's just something to bear in mind. Now this first row right here, I'm probably not going to mess with anything here. We've got militiamen who are just terrible. Slingers, also terrible. Spearmen, which are marginally better. They're okay at counterattacking and things like that. But we've also got bowmen who are debatably useful. They're really expensive. Let's talk about the statistics, though. So every unit has statistics, and we'll do that while we hire our first hero. So down here at the bottom, we can hire our first hero unit. And we have a choice between the warrior, the scout, the commander, and the wizard. The warrior plays much as you think he would. He pretty much just puts his head down and swings at things, and he wears super awesome armor, has crazy amounts of weaponry, and deals loads of melee damage. His problem is going to come in the late game when everything sort of swaps over to being magical. He's going to take a lot of hits as the game goes along, and unfortunately the warrior, while good in the early game, is not so good in the late game. The scout. The scout is a ranged character. He's basically a ranger. He has a bow. He fires from long distances away, which makes him a very good, very adaptable character for both new players and old players alike. Most of the luck I've had in the game has actually been with playing the scout. He's quite good. He translates well to endgame with good gear, and he's also good in the early game. In fact, he's a good substitute and keeps you from having to hire ridiculous amounts of archers early on. The commander is sort of a unique unit, and what he does is he buffs everybody in his group. I don't like him very much, and there is some debate on the forums about whether he's actually a viable character. Most people seem to think he's useless, but just rest assured that as he levels, he gets more and more types of auras that make everybody in his retinue better. At the same time, he remains weak, feeble, and pretty much terrible at combat, so he's kind of a wasted unit, all things considered. The wizard is another great unit. I pair him with the scout as the two truly viable heroes that you can actually play. The hero is the wizard, that is. The hero wizard is a little bit weaker in the early game, as you would expect if you wanted to keep in line with the overall cliche from fantasy. But as the game goes along, he becomes like unbearably powerful. The only problem with him is that the scout is his weakness. Like, scouts can one-shot him no problem from across the map early on in a fight. So I'm going to go with a scout in this playthrough. There we are. And we've got Slit, the scout. So I don't want to know how he earned that name. Hopefully it wasn't slitting anyone important to me or his former employer. But if we look at his stats page, there's a number of things we want to be aware of. So first and foremost, up here it'll say he's a scout, obviously. And everybody generates a random ability when you first make the character. He got diplomacy, which is okay. It means we get 10% rewards from all of our... We get better rewards from our quests, and we also have lower prices in stores. That's going to be marginally useful, depending on how many stores we unlock and how much money we end up spending. He comes with a retinue. Terrible militiamen who pad themselves. They smell like hay. They generally don't bathe. They're not very good at fighting. Not a great unit. He's also got slingers, which we can make them work for now, but also not a unit we want to rely on in the long run. Most importantly on this page, though, you want to look at the overall stats that each character possesses. So we've got hit points. He's got a good hit point pool. Stamina. Every time you take an action, you lose one stamina. So he can make 11 actions before he gasses out and gets tired. His morale is a little bit higher than some of the other heroes, like the wizard who only has 10. When morale runs out, what happens is you just end up running around like a chicken with your head off, cut off, screaming at the sky, weeping madly, and just kind of being useless. He can move two hexes per turn in the combat screen. His melee attack deals four damage. His counterattack in melee does three. He has no ranged armor. He has no melee armor. This is a game of small numbers, so if you have one ranged armor, it means that you reduce the damage you take from ranged by one. I like that, and I respect that streamlined approach tremendously. Why deal with kind of percentages and things if you can just deal with flat reductions would be my argument there. Resistance is going to be his magical resistance, so if he gets hit with a magic missile, it'll do minus one damage. His ranged attack does seven damage base. He can do it from five hexes away, and he can fire eight times. He's got eight ammo on him. He's got a little bit of gear here, a short bow, and some common arrows. So hopefully every unit, if I right-click any unit, they all have their own statistics. And as I kind of unlock things, I'll talk about what their statistics are. 
But as you can tell, if you want to pause this right here, the Militiaman is terrible. He's only really good at holding a spot and kind of counterattacking. Even then, he's probably going to get he's probably going to get gibbed very very quickly. His beard will not save him. Even though that is a pretty mighty beard. I mean, that's a beard that would get ne it would give Nebuchadnezzar a good run for his money. But still, not a good enough beard to keep him alive. Going back to our screen here, you'll see that our hero has actually appeared in the capital. And there's a couple options. The first is that we can explore a location. Now, we've actually got a pretty good amount of locations unlocked. We've got a Forlorn Manor, which has vampires. Pretty tough. Ancient Ruins with Slugs. Very tough. A Ruined Tower with Gargoyles. That's a pretty nasty fight, too. Ancient Ruins that are full of Medusas. Nasty. We don't want to mess with that. Centaurs, also terrible. Undead. We could probably beat the Undead if we were lucky. Lizard Men, we could probably beat if we were really lucky. Retinue, I actually think that this is a... Oh, it's a plate armory. Okay. So this is a store that's located at our hex, which we could actually go to and buy gear from. And then a temple full of druids. I don't really know what that entails. I don't think I've ever fought any druids, to be fair. We can also explore. Now, if you look right here, Whitestone is 60% explored. And as we explore the province more and more, more of these locations will show up. Preferably easier ones that we can actually steamroll our way through. Ones filled with goblins brigands, things of that nature. Basically things that we can cut our teeth on as we go through the game. And so, let me go ahead for a moment, and actually in this first little bit, I think what we're gonna do is we're actually just gonna bypass a turn by exploring for a little bit. So there it is, we've locked in our order for the turn. And then let's explore. It's gonna show the turns of our two enemies, and it says, while exploring the province of Whitestone, the hero Slit has found something unusual, an ancient crypt. So that's gonna be filled with undead, obviously. There's six of them. The hero Slit has approached the ancient crypt. It looks like the burial vault of an ancient ruler, a great warrior, and one is certain to find something valuable among the belongings of the deceased. There's also six enemies guarding it. Any distribution of six between skeletons and zombies. They outnumber us, we're not going to be able to win, so we're going to retreat. As a bonus though, the construction that we scheduled in the previous turn of our tavern is now done, and so what we can do is we can go to our military quarter, and we can talk about units. So this first line right here, militiamen are terrible, slingers, pretty terrible. Spearmen are the first unit worth talking about, so let's talk about them. In every tier of units, you only get to pick a certain number. Now, in this first tier, we get to pick four of these to be part of our army. Here, it says we've got zero out of four. And the first choice is the Spearman. The Spearman has reasonable HP. He can move a reasonable distance. He's also got a good attack and a good counterattack. And he comes with a bonus. He can throw a javelin once per combat, which is pretty cool. It's nice to have those extra little skirmishing abilities. Additionally, he's got heavy ammo three, which means that he breaks people's range defense after he hits them for three turns. His upkeep is five gold. Now, the spearmen suffer from the same syndrome that the militiamen do in that they're not that great. Aside from being super cheap and being able to die in plenty, not really the unit that I want to invest in. The second unit we want to look at is the Bowman. Now, because we're playing as the Scout, I see no reason to go with the Bowman, but he's a unit with a reasonable attack value from a long ways away. His HP is not so good, though, so be careful. He can die, and he's very expensive. That's his main drawback, is in order to rain death down upon your foes from deep downfield, it's, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Now, he does get a trait as he levels up that allows him to offset his cost. So, if you had a stationary unit like the Warrior, he'd probably be a decent choice, or if you're playing the Mage, not a terrible choice, but not the one we're going to make in this game. There's the Swordsman. Now, another thing that I wanted to point out is that every unit has an alignment. This guy is lawful, which means he's a good guy. If you put good guys and bad guys in the same party, you lose morale. Now, I've never had a problem with it. My morale has never run out, even with assorted groups, so I don't really pay attention to it that much, but if you're playing on higher difficulties, it will matter. The Swordsman can't move very far. He only moves one, but he's got great defense. His defense to melee is reduced by three. His damage in ranged is reduced by five, and he's also got a little bit of magic resistance. His counterattack and his melee attack are equal, so he's great for holding choke points. If he can just stand there and just soak damage, that is the best place to put him. Additionally, he has an ability called parry, which means the first attack made against him in melee in each turn is going to have its... He's going to have his defense increased by two and the damage reduced by two, basically. Pretty cool unit, one that we'll consider. Pikemen are pretty much the same thing as Spearmen. The only difference is instead of being able to throw a Javelin, they get First Strike, which is an amazing ability. So First Strike means that you counterattack before the enemy hits you. It essentially lets you hit first whenever you're attacked, which gives you a good chance to give the guy that just rolled up on you. His counterattack is no slouch either at 8 damage, so we'll be considering him. His upkeep's not so bad, neither is his cost. He does require a bit of iron, though, to recruit. You can see that resource right there. 
there's the crossbowman. We're not even going to mess with the crossbowman. He's basically the same thing as the bowman, but his damage is armor piercing, so he actually ignores range defense, but as a penalty, he can't shoot as far. Here we've got the healer. We'll think about taking him. The healer has a spammable cure that he can throw at people, which can prolong things. We'll probably end up hiring him because we don't have a wizard as of yet, but we'll keep that on the table for later. We're definitely going to hire some barbarians, and this is the reason why. The barbarians are hands down the best tier 1 unit, period. I don't care what anybody says, they're the best. It's one of those things that it's not really debatable in Eodor. At 20 HP, a huge amount of stamina, a nice attack, and also they have a skirmish they can throw an axe. This unit is just fantastic. He's got an ability called Berserker, which in Eodor, every time your unit takes damage, their attack power goes down. So it's a lot like Shadowrun or other D&D type games where as you take damage, you become weaker. Berserker means that that doesn't happen to him. So he can have 1 HP. He's still going to hit for the 9 amount. If his, his maximum damage, I should say, to reword that a little bit better. His maximum damage of 9 is going to remain intact no matter how injured he is. So he could literally be bleeding out the rectum just like his intestines falling out of his guts and he's still going to hit like a truck. And that's why I usually take barbarians. So let's go ahead and construct the barbarian camp. So there it is. It cost us a little bit of money, 140. It also cost us a little bit of karma because he's an evil character. So that kind of sucks. The thief is kind of like a quicker moving, more adaptable version of the barbarian. His damage is a little bit lower. His counterattack is the same, but where he's different is that a lower HP and a lower morale, he has more ranged attacks, so he can throw knives, which can be useful in certain situations. He's good at kiting, and additionally, he can't be counterattacked against. Now, he does come with an added problem in that he's a marauder, which means he gets 15% of all the loot that you get in combat, so he's definitely not coming. We don't need any stingy kind of D-bags in our group. I would like to keep things close to the chest. Finally, we've got the Brigand, who's basically a bruiser. He has the same problem that the Thief has in that he marauds, and also he takes from your taxes. So any zone that he's in, you get a reduced amount of money from it because he runs around robbing and pillaging as he's in the area. The Shaman is the final unit of note. She's a ranged magical class, and she's actually quite good at what she does. This is probably going to be our next unit. She comes with Magical Shot, which is incredibly useful, so she can also curse enemies and lower their attack and defense. We'll consider her for later, but for now we want to focus on other things. After we get Barbarians in the next turn, I'd also like to go to the Craftsman's Quarter and get a workshop ready so that we can get ourselves a leather jacket, increase both of our defensive statistics a little bit, and it's not a huge investment, but it will help in the greater scheme of things because look at all these buildings that get unlocked by the Craftsman's District. You get foundries, you get all kinds of good stuff. There's loads of units that we can't use until we have this place, so it's something that we want to think about. With that all said and done, let's take a quick pan and scan through, but I think that's going to do it for this turn. After that, let's get a granary going, because growth in our city is always a good thing. It means we get more money. And so let's bypass our turn here exploring, and in the next turn we should be able... Ooh, we got an event! And so while exploring the province of Whitestone, the hero Slit has found a secret hollow. Dragon Root, a rare herb with magical properties, grows here on the banks of a small rivulet. Gathering it can increase your gem income, but if you plow up the fertile lands, the taxes from the province will be significantly increased. Another option is to allow settlers to build their houses here. Life in such a picturesque place will have a wholesome effect on the population's mood. I'm going to plow the land because there are a few things in the early game as important as getting your money up. So you can see we just went from 30 per turn to 35 per turn. You can get that event multiple times too, so if you get really lucky, you can end up with a very, very rich province. This window right here is just letting us know that our other construction is finished of the Barbarian Camp, and we can now start the construction of our workshop. We want to go now to our Higher Troops menu, and I'm going to fire this Militiaman right here. I'm going to keep the Slinger for now, and we're going to hire two groups of Barbarians. Another added effect that the Tavern has is that it makes it so that another bar we get a recruitment slot right here which is filled with a random unit now right now it's a mercenary that's a barbarian but we could really get anything right here from golems to elves to all kinds of crazy stuff so you want to pay attention to your mercenary list they cost a little bit more but they tend to be outside of your access range as well so you might get an elf or a dwarf way before you could normally access them so we've got our two barbarians now in a slinger and i think we're in a good spot to invade our first territory I think what we're going to do is we're going to attack the Brigand Outlaws here in Pixie Woods. There's a lot of things we can do with Woods that are going to give us a little bit of money. And right now, I just want to get as much cash income going as humanly possible. So, in the next turn, we're going to sally on over to the Pixie Woods and see what kind of trouble we can get ourselves into. 
The hero Slit has entered the Pixie Woods, and there are four enemies, Brigands, Thieves, and Bowmans. Now this could be a rough fight. If I wasn't positive of our abilities, we could negotiate, which means we could pay them off. That gives us goodness points, and additionally, it doesn't lower the morale of the province if we conquer it, but we're gonna get into a fist fight here because I know you guys wanna see some combat before this whole thing is resolved. Because we can see our enemies first, it means they're going to take the first shot. So what I want to do is any ranged unit needs to be on a hill because that increase, increases their range by one. We additionally want to be as far away as possible so that that bowman doesn't get a shot on the first turn. We actually want to try and coax him off that hill if at all possible. So I think this arrangement's going to work for us right here. There we go. So he's off the hill now. Let's take a look at our units and see who can get shot at. Now, I've got my hero slit highlighted here. If you look at the feet, it can be tough to see, especially if you're colorblind. But if it's dim underneath him, he can't reach them with his range. But if it's dark underneath him, he can. He's going to take a shot at this first thug. Just kind of whittle him down a tad. No other unit can make an action during the course of this turn, so we're just going to bypass. That bowman is trying to get in range of us. We need to handle him. Now, all experienced players at Eodor will tell you that the order of kills is going to be wizards, bowman, and then melee. So what I want to do first is take a shot at this bowman. Now, at 6 to 8 damage, he only has 6 HP. We can right-click anybody on the battlefield and look at their stats. He's at 6 HP, so we're going to kill him no matter what with this shot. That means that we're safe to pepper the enemy with arrows as we go along. Now, we've got a little bit of damage there. I'm going to move my Barbarian forward. Let's look at the way that things can move. I could move out and kill him, guaranteed this turn. The other option, it looks like he's going to be able to step into range of my Slinger no matter what. So I think what I'll do is actually kind of move my defense around so at least my Slinger doesn't take any damage. I don't like my Slinger that much, he's kind of a jerk, but I'll wait to kill him off till later. So we'll bypass the turn now. These guys can't use their attack until he's within one range of him. Probably not the best move right there, but it does shield my Slinger. And so there with the counterattack, that first thug was gibbed. And that leaves us with the remainder of this just to kind of pepper these guys with arrows. I'm going to take a shot at that rogue. And it said it might kill him, but at 7 HP, it looks like he's got one left. He's probably not going to hit us too hard in the instance that he does get down here. The Slinger's not able to reach anybody with his attack. We're not able to move over and attack anybody either, so I guess we're just going to have to sit here until they get a tad closer. Because they're within or they're within two hexes right now, we can, use to throw, we can throw an axe from our Barbarian. There it goes. And that's going to kill that first gent. And this is one of the other reasons why I very much like the Barbarians. That first little skirmishing attack can definitely help. There's another one going towards this Brigand. We'll fire an arrow, and then we'll also hit him with a little bit of extra sling damage. So he's now sitting at 4 health. He's going to come in and take an attack. There it is, 7 damage to this guy. He's going to berserk out, and then he's going to swing back. So 3 damage done there. I'm going to let my hero have the kill for the sole reason that in this game, the person that deals the last damage gets the most XP. And my hero is the one that I'm interested in leveling. So there it is. We have our Butcher's Bill here. Now it's going to take our guys a little bit of time to heal. This Barbarian in particular, it's probably going to take him four or five turns to feel better. We got a knife. We also got 23 gold. Slit has leveled up. And so his parameters have increased. Now the stat that you get every turn is random. But every 10 levels, at level 9, every Ranger is going to have the same stats. So even though it's random, the order that you get things you will have the same stats at level 9 every single time you reach level 9. So the health, not the best thing that I would want right now. What ideally the stat that I would want is command or magic. Magic would increase the amount of abilities that I can store by one, and command would allow me to have another unit in my overall squad. But we have the ability to choose from some perks here. So we can get Diplomacy 2. If you remember from earlier on, we already had Diplomacy. Not a big fan. We can also take Reaction, which increases our initiative, gives us a higher chance to act first and also increases our ranged defense and our magical resistance. Cool thing to have. Or we can go with Marksmanship, which increases our base damage with our ranged attack. I'm going to go with that because an 8 damage attack from Deep Field is no joke. Additionally, our Barbarian leveled up, so we have the choice to either give him Berserker plus 1. That means that he gets an attack bonus when he Berserks out. Basically, he gets an extra damage, or we can give him an extra HP. I'm going to go with the Berserk bonus since most, Berserk, or most Barbarians seem to spend most of their time in Berserk mode. Their HP is pretty sufficient anyways. We've also got a scheduled construction, so we're going to finish that off. And we've got a new territory right here. Now you can see a little house on this territory. That means that it's overpopulated. If you look over to the side, it's got the explored in 16%. It's red. That means we need to explore in order for this province to grow. They're being made grumpy by the fact that they're overpopulated. So let's do a bit of exploration here with the last couple minutes of this LP. 
And I think that's more or less going to put me where I want to be. Hopefully we find some interesting things here. It looks like Slit was able to find a primeval thicket. We'll examine it. The primeval thicket has giants and sp Oh, a giant spider. Not giants and spiders, but giant spiders. That's no bueno, so we're going to walk away from that one. And we're going to continue exploring until hopefully this turns white for a little bit. Just so we can keep people on the happy side. On the plus side, because we liberated the place from bandits, the population is pretty stoked that we're actually their new lord. It's generating three gold per turn for us and also some crystals. Now, because our construction queue is pretty much finished, we want to think about what we can do with that area. The first thing we want to look at, let's see here, is we want to look at the possibility of getting a Carpenter's Guild. The Carpenter's Guild only requires a workshop. Now, we've already built that in the early game, and what the Carpenter's Guild allows us to do is it increases the amount of income that we get from certain resources, but more importantly, it lets us build a sawmill in forest provinces. If you were paying attention, we have cleared out a forest province, and in the interest of our pocketbook, or our man purse, we want to make sure that we're generating as much income as possible, so that's going to be the next building that I'm going to jump into. At 190 gold, it's going to take us a little bit to break even on this one, but at the same time, I think it's a good investiture. Let's go back to our world map, and I want to make sure he's still exploring. Good, good, good. And let's do this thing. Alrighty, so now we have the ability to make a sawmill. If we right-click on the province, we can actually go to Construct right here, and you'll see that there's a sawmill. It increases our in income by 5, and so at 190, it's going to take us about 36 turns to make up the cost, plus the 73 from here, which is like, you know, another 16 turns or so, another 14 turns. So it's going to be a little while before we break even on it. At the same time, the earlier we build this, the sooner we'll break even, so that's something to think about. Let's continue exploring here. I don't think I actually explored on that last turn. I'm feeling a little bit duncy about it, but we didn't find anything, but we did explore 5% of the province. That's very, very good, and you can see it went white right here, and the growth has begun happening again. Additionally, you can see that we're getting 7 gold per turn from this forest. Very cool. Now, our sites for the next couple episodes are going to be on these two provinces. In the hills, we can build mines, which allow us to do the same thing as the sawmill. Just get a little bit of extra cash, and this one's a forest right here, too, so as many sawmills as we can get is going to be the MO for the time being. Let's go ahead and wait for one more turn here. And it looks like we found a lair of bandits. We'll examine it. It looks like there's five bandits here, brigands, thieves, bowmans, and assassins. Now, the assassin is a higher level unit. That's a tier two unit, so we definitely don't want to tempt fate with that one. We're just going to keep exploring. Let's see what we can construct here. The other things we want to think about constructing in this early game is a pottery. The pottery is going to increase the amount of money we make each turn by two. It costs 84, so once again, 32 turns, or I'm sorry, 42. I can do math, I swear. 42 turns until this one breaks even, but the sooner we get on it, once again, the sooner we see that return. Our cash flow is not so amazing right now, but it's good enough to where I'm not absolutely terrified of what's going to happen. At any time, we can open the statistics right here and take a look. And we're generating 30 gold per turn. So from everything we have, we're making 45. Our expenses, 15, are all coming from armies with heroes. So 30 and plus 8, not bad at all. It'll also say what turn we're on, how many enemies we fought, how many victories we have, things of that nature, our skill level. All things to consider, how much loot we've uncovered, a bunch of cool stuff like that. So let's go back to the world map once more. We'll continue exploring. Okay, and we didn't uncover anything, but we did explore a little bit further. We're at 29% right here. Something to think about is the possibility of rolling this location. Let's take a look at our army really quickly. We could do that by going to our hero menu here. And our barbarian is fully healed at this point, so we want to think about it auto-equipped our knife right there. That's good. I guess if we ever get into melee, we can swap out to the weapon and it'll help us out a tad, but knife is probably not the best thing to bring along. Let's see what we can do with this province right here before we run out of time in the episode. So headed to buy place. Looks like we've got four enemies at this location, a brigand, a thief, and a bowman. More or less a similar composition to what we went up against in the last battle. So let's go straight on in, just headlong, front flipping over the hills here. Well, maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I don't know if we can front flip. They're going to get the first turn. He's on a hill, so more than likely he's going to take the shot either way. So let's just set ourselves up. I'm going to put everybody in a forest for now, because characters in forests get increased defense from range attacks. Just something to think about since he gets a first shot on us. And there it goes, like I predicted. Straight to our archer. So unfortunately, the one hero that I didn't put in the forest, the AI is pretty smart about the way it runs its business. He's got enough HP anyways, so let's go ahead and kill off that bowman with our first shot. 
And down he goes. Other than that, we'll take a shot at that thief right there. Since he doesn't have much defense, he might be able to throw a knife at the slinger on the next turn. In fact, I guarantee he will. Oh, he didn't. Alright, well let's kill him then. Just to make sure he doesn't get within range of my slinger. My slinger can also throw into this forest right here doing at most one damage. Not the best way to spend my time, but it is something in the greater scheme of things. Let's move this unit to here, just in case he decides to reposition himself here so that we can throw axes. Okay, and he did. So let's go ahead and pummel him as heavily as we can. And so there's 8 damage already, which means my hero can pretty much just drop him outright. The final thing that we're going to want to do is actually move our slinger back, so that this unit right here either has to go through a forest to get to him, this will take him 2 turns to close the gap, or he has to take 1 turn and get in here with my barbarians who can actually take the brunt of his attack. He's going to go with the latter option, and he's going to hit us for 8. That's actually a pretty good swing. When he berserked, he's going to do a little bit of damage, but not anything satisfactory. I'm going to have this Barbarian come over here and take the final swing at him. And so there it is, down he goes. And the combat is resolved. We get 24 gold, no spoils, but our hero Slit has leveled up again. He got another health. We're not being very lucky with our level ups, but I'm not going to weep and cry about it as of yet. Once again, it's going to let us choose between Diplomacy, increasing the rewards from quests, and also lowering the prices at stores. Reaction, increasing our initiative and our defensive stats. Or Pathfinding, which means that we get forest knowledge, hill knowledge, swamp knowledge. It makes us move a little bit quicker. That basically means that he can move through forests without losing an extra movement point. I think it also gives him an attack bonus if he's in a forest. The hills knowledge would be interesting since we always want to put a hero with a bow on a hill. But for now, I think we're going to increase our defensive stats and our initiative. Our slinger has leveled up there from the distributed XP that you get. I'm going to increase his health by one because he has really low health and could possibly be killed by a bowman with one shot. Our barbarian has leveled up to level one. We can increase his stamina or we can give him an attack bonus when he increases his berserker or when he reaches berserker mode. I'm going to give him the attack bonus and I think that's going to work out for us. And so we've taken by place. Once again, we're going to need to explore this location, which I think I'm going to jump straight in and do. We want to think about building a new location as well. Now, before we go any further, we've got our melee combat wrapped up, so I'd very much like to get a ranged unit. I'm going to think about building a witch's hut, or a totem. What we need to do that, though, is an altar. So let's go ahead and swing on over to the altar. And unfortunately, because I have this in a weird windowed mode to make this work, we're actually going to have to go back over to, I believe it's in the... Let's see here. Oh, it's in the priest quarter. So there we are, the altar. The altar is going to allow us to resurrect people for cheaper and also cast rituals. Rituals are like spells that you can cast on your cities and your units, so bear that in mind. We don't have a wizard right now, but we need the altar so we can get witches in the next turn. I think this is as good a spot as any to break off the episode. Now, my name is Splattercat. Thank you for joining me here to play Eodor, Masters of the Arcane, at the Nerd Castle. In my first episodes, I always leave it up to you guys. If you would like to see more of this game, I can absolutely turn this into a full-length series. If this seemed really boring to you guys, I have other games on the skillet on the back burner, so we can definitely take a look at those if this is not you guys' speed. So let me know down in the comments what you think, and I will definitely take stock. Maybe not necessarily a vote, I'm just kind of looking for the overall feel of what you guys think about the game. And once that's all decided, we'll jump out there and see if there's going to be more episodes or if we're going to move on to something else. I hope you like the look of the game, and take care out there, everybody.